Today, we're going to be talking about a really hot button issue that a billion people have already made a trillion videos on, and you're probably tired of hearing about by now, but I just really got to express my opinion on anyways because I'm old, and that's what old people do. We tell everybody our life story because we think it's somehow more important than everything else. And that topic is emulation. It's the perfect topic for Halloween because, as we all know, nothing is scarier than playing games that were designed for a specific console on a console that it wasn't designed for. It's hideous. I get hives just thinking about it. Now let me take you back a ways, you know, before I was a llama, and this will all make sense. There was a game called Banjo-Kazooie. It was a fun-ass game that everyone my age and older will probably tell you is a masterpiece of platformers. Now unfortunately, my mother <clears throat> misplaced our N64 and all of our games when I was like seven, so that meant I couldn't play it anymore. Even though I would ask for a second-hand 64 every Christmas for the next five years, they just never got me one for whatever reason, and that really bummed me out. But fast forward a few more years, I'm like 12 years old and I say, alright, enough is enough. I opened Pandora's box and got an N64 emulator and a ROM of Banjo-Kazooie on my family's PC along with like 7 different viruses. After all these years, I was finally back at home playing one of the most classic, highly revered games of all time, an inglorious 1920x1200 resolution. I don't know why our monitor had that resolution, but whatever, it was the mid-2000s, it was a different era, okay? Eventually, I would become a game collector anyway, so I do actually have a legal copy of Banjo-Kazooie and just about every game that I emulate. My brother even bought me a copy of Mother 3, so I don't feel that guilty about emulation. That puts me more in the safe zone than a lot of emulation users, although ROMs on the internet belong to somebody else, so it's not exactly a one-to-one -one solution, but most people won't even go that far, so whatever. What this also did for me was give me more perspective vis-a-vis -vis the pros and cons of emulation versus original hardware, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now the big question with emulation is always, is it legal? And the most common answer to that question is usually somebody saying, eh, it's a gray area, or eh, it depends. Now let's do a little myth busting real quick. Myth. Emulation is piracy. Fact. No it isn't, and if I ever catch you saying that, I will slap you with a fish. To be fair, it wouldn't be inaccurate to say that emulation and piracy are adjacent topics at the very least. I think a lot of the confusion comes from the fact that for older games, like GameCube and before, you can usually find the ROMs after googling for a few minutes, and for a lot of people, this will be how they source them. The source spot vis-a-vis -vis the law and piracy is how you source the ROMs, and doing it that way, you know, without paying money for it, yeah, maybe that could be interpreted as stealing. The argument in favor of doing it this way is usually something to the effect of, well, they're not selling the games anymore, so I'm not stealing any of the profits by doing this, which isn't always true. When you consider the occasional re-release or commercial emulators, which I'm gonna circle back to in a minute, but in the cases where it is, that's a very reasonable argument, especially when you consider things like preservation. On the other hand, the reality is that nobody gets thrown in prison for downloading Kerb on the NES. That's just not a thing that happens. At the same time, for everything after GameCube, downloading ROMs is a much, much more involved and dangerous process, and since a lot of those games are still in circulation, that's going to be way harder to justify legally and morally, and even if you do jump through all the hoops to do it, you'll probably get a terrifying email from your ISP telling you that the ESA caught your ass in 4K, and they may be forced to hand over your personal info to them upon Upon request. Now again, an email like this doesn't necessarily mean you'll be thrown in prison with serial murderers, but I guess it's still a possibility, technically? I'm not a lawyer, I don't know, I generally don't tend to download newer games anyway just to stay on the safe side, so... Really not my forte. However, if you do still want to emulate Switch games, but want to be at least 40% sure you won't get stabbed in jail for doing it, Something you can do is use a Switch with homebrew software and a legal copy of whatever game you're wanting to play, 
and using your homebrew switch you can dump the ROM onto an external drive which you can then run on an emulator on your PC. Now this might not be 100% kosher either because it involves hacking and modding a switch which surprise surprise Nintendo doesn't like you doing, but to do it this way you have to buy a switch and the game, the same as you would if you would just be playing the game normally, so you're emulating in 4K 60fps and you still bought both a switch and Breath of the Wild for full price, so Nintendo still got the full payment that they would have gotten if you played it the regular way and you get to play Switch games with ray trace reflections. For all intents and purposes, everybody wins, at least from my perspective. Again, I'm not a lawyer. But the point is that the big legal issue with emulation is pretty much always the way you source the ROMs. Emulation itself is not a crime. Project 64 literally has a donation page. They have an emulator and they're asking for money to keep the project going. That is crazy. You know damn well that if emulators were illegal, the Project 64 devs would be launched into the sun by now. Probably the funniest thing I hear about emulators is that they're inauthentic and that they're not the right way to experience the game. Yeah, you want an authentic and pure experience? Go and play GoldenEye on original hardware with the N64's control stick at 15 FPS. Play the Control Center mission on double O agent difficulty and then come back and tell me that that's the proper way to experience the game. Now to be fair, I am a game collector myself so I understand this mindset somewhat. Playing the game on original hardware feels like brushing off an ancient artifact and going back in time, which is really cool in its own right. But sometimes you just want to play the fucking game. I don't always care about the authentic experience and neither do a lot of people. At the end of the day, the authentic experience is mostly a pseudo luxury. Pseudo being the key word here because in many respects it's often way worse. I don't know about you, but I don't love Diddy Kong Racing for its 240i resolution or its inconsistent frame rate when you're burning rubber in Frosty Village or because the N64 control stick is really good. It's not, by the way. I love it because I'm a fucking bear in a go-kart shooting missiles at a goddamn chimpanzee, and I can do that very same thing on an emulator with none of those outdated issues, and it's great. Unless we're talking about something like speedrunning, where a difference in frame rates and low times could be an unfair advantage to emulation users. The reality is there is often very little technical advantage to playing on an original machine. A lot of us love the games for what they are, not for the machine that they happen to exist on, so it doesn't really matter if it's on a computer. Are emulators impure and inauthentic? Maybe, but who the hell cares? Is playing the updated version of Doom that you get on Steam impure because it's not the DOS version that's locked at 35 FPS and doesn't have proper resolution scaling because it's not a real 3D game? And if it is, again, do you care? Like weigh the risk and reward, with DOS version you play the broken ass original game and nobody on the internet will yell at you, or you play the new version, it works properly and people might yell at you but just log off Twitter, who gives a hell? Just play the goddamn game. It's amazing. And just to be clear, this is not to shame anybody who would rather have the pure authentic experience. It's still valid in my book. No matter where you stand, it's fine to criticize anything, but don't let somebody shame you for playing whatever they want. It's video games. Like, big picture, there are much better reasons to get angry at somebody. I am very good at being angry at people, so feel free to reach out to me anytime and I'll give you 20 reasons to be angry at anybody. Now, I'm sure some people out there will probably tell you that they never have and never will use an emulator in their life because it is immoral and impure. Well, prepare yourself for a shock, because if you have ever played a game on the Wii or Wii U Virtual Console or bought GBA games on the 3DS eShop or used a Nintendo Switch Online service, surprise bitch, you used an emulator and you're going to jail now. Alright, in all seriousness, I know what they really mean. They mean they won't play a game without paying for it, and that makes sense, especially for newer games that need to sell well if you want them to make more. Metroid Dread is one of the best games I've played in years, so that shit 
it better sell well. I want to be playing Metroid Dread 17 when I'm in the nursing home. But of course, if you use a homebrew Switch and a legal copy of Metroid Dread, you can emulate it while still buying the game, so, you know. As to Nintendo's official emulators, the big thing that sold me on the Wii back in the day was the fact that it played N64 games, according to what I was told. Now, me being 8 years old when the Wii was first launched, I didn't really grasp what that meant. I had images in my mind of some abomination console that had like a billion different cartridge slots for all the consoles it could play, but it turns out that the Wii Virtual Console was just that, a virtual console, which is a fancy way of saying emulator. Nintendo sold N64 games for download at about 10 bucks a pop, which was pretty cool, but I quickly realized that the only games I could get on the Virtual Console were the ones that Nintendo was willing to put there, and that I would never have access to the whole library, which was a real shame because I really wanted to play Earthworm Jim 3D again. Don't know why, I just really like that game for some reason. And that's the problem with a lot of older games, a good chunk of them are not made available on any of those services. Nintendo Switch Online has roughly 50 NES games and 50 Super Nintendo games, which sounds like a lot until you consider that the original NES library had over 700 games and the SNES had like fucking 2000. The reality is that Nintendo is drip feeding us these games at the pace of a constipated sloth and they're not even necessarily prioritizing prioritizing the more important ones either. What the fuck is Operation Windback? I've never even heard of that. Is that even a real video game? Actually, that looks pretty fun. There are still some very shocking omissions from the library even three years after it came out because they'd rather put Prehistoric Man on there. If there's a Super Nintendo game that you're wanting to see, there really is no guarantee that it will ever show up here. I don't know what the hell Nintendo is doing, but between potential licensing issues and the fact that Nintendo is famous for secrecy and weird decisions, I imagine that no matter what you want to see, it's really up in the air. Switch Online will probably have the fucking Home Alone video game before they even think about putting Earthbound on there. Your next official option is to buy it on original hardware, so first you need to hunt down a working Super Nintendo. Then you gotta get a copy of Earthbound, which will probably cost more than the Switch. I love this game, but $400 for one video game is just fucking bonkers. It's redonkulous. This is where emulators save the day. Nintendo's not selling it anymore, and everyone on eBay is charging an arm and a leg and a testicle for it, so that's when you just say, fuck it. Like, I'm sorry, Nintendo, but what does a man do, right? Let's face it, what does a man do? What about Mother 3? This might be the best RPG ever made, and there doesn't even exist an official English translation. The only way to play it is the fan translation, which, by the way, is incredibly professional and well done. Unless you buy one of those bootleg cartridges, you'll be emulating that shit too. With this kind of emulation, you can find any game, no matter how obscure it is, and play it in a matter of minutes. I'm pretty much the only one I know who remembers Tetrisphere on the N64. Doesn't matter, I can get it. For all I know, I'm literally the only person in the world who even thinks about this game anymore. Which means that there's no guarantee that it will end up on any official emulation service because that's too much effort to get money from one person. It's a stupid business decision, but with unofficial emulators, it's not a business decision at all because it's not being sold by the original copyright owners. It's a three second download and that's it. Aside from money and accessibility, both official and non-official emulators have their share of advantages. As we've established, Nintendo Switch Online is emulation and Project 64 is emulation. But what separates this emulator from this emulator? While this emulator can let me play the game at any resolution or aspect ratio I want, I can remap button layouts, I can use whatever controller can be plugged in with a USB cable, and I can even use graphical modifications to tweak visuals and make them look better. Some emulators let you use custom textures, some have these horrible, horrible smoothing filters, not to mention all the quality of life stuff like consistent frame rates and save states and game shark codes. It gives you a unique level of control over how the game works and how you can play it that most official commercial services won't give you. So what makes this emulator so special then? Well, it costs $50 a year and it says Nintendo on it, and it also has these stupid borders at the side that they don't let you disable, and it has weirdo button mapping that sucks ass. Why did you map Y next to camera control? That make no sense. 
but it's also easier to use and requires none of that setup that unofficial emulators do, and also also generally doesn't have nearly as many bugs and glitches as something like Project 64 might. Not to mention you can play online as long as you have a decent connection. The number of times I've been stuck at my computer spending half an hour trying different graphics plugins and settings just to play Paper Mario without broken ass flickering sprites is too many to count. And usually I just say, alright, well fuck it, I'll play something else, I'll go play Honey Pop or something. And that's where official emulation comes in and saves the day. Except when it doesn't. Sadly, in spite of their price tags and despite being developed by the people who literally designed the original hardware, there really is no guarantee at all that an official commercial emulator will function better than an unofficial one made by amateur programmers. Remember the PlayStation Mini? This was a juiced up Raspberry Pi running a custom version of PCSXE, which is usually a very decent piece of software that was absolutely squandered on this shitty piece of plastic. This thing had like 20 or 30 PS1 games and half of them were European ROMs that ran at the wrong refresh rate which they probably downloaded off of MU paradise before Nintendo shut it down, and then they sold it for a hundred dollars. It was such a shit show. I hadn't felt that much secondhand embarrassment for a video game company since Microsoft's DRM fiasco of 2013. Which brings us to the thing that you're really watching the video for. To watch me shit on Nintendo Switch Online. The three of you that watch my videos religiously may recall that when the expansion pack was first announced, I was actually really excited for it. Of course, that was before I found out that it was 50 US dollars a year, which translates to 64 oh. Canadians, so uh... Yeah, a little less excited now. My excitement was further diminished when just a few days ago I started browsing Twitter and came across several disconcerting reports. Apparently Ocarina of Time is full of weird graphical bugs that don't exist on any other version. It doesn't have the fog effect now, the reflections in the water don't show up. Apparently the Switch's N64 emulation is in many ways somehow even worse than the Wii U. After 15 years of Nintendo re-releasing N64 games since the Wii Virtual Console, they haven't figured out how to emulate them properly. Which is pretty disappointing when you consider that even dumpy ass Project 64 understands how to render fog in Ocarina of Time. Even worse than that, I've heard deeply concerning reports of terrible input latency with Ocarina. Without playing it myself, I really can't confirm or deny if that's true, but I'm just saying, you know, if that's true? That's some fool ass shit. On top of that, Switch Online has introduced no solution for N64 memory cards, so games that require it may not function fully. Kinda like how Mario Kart 64, there's no way to save ghost data. You might say that it's not that big of a deal, or that it isn't reasonable to expect a commercial emulator to be able to emulate every single feature on the original hardware, but if I can tick a little box in Project 64 that lets me automatically create and use a virtual memory card, there really is no excuse. The PlayStation 3 let you make virtual PS1 and PS2 memory cards, so I really don't know why it's an unreasonable expectation. I mean, it's a goddamn memory card, dude. That's the most basic crap in the world, I'm not asking them to start emulating the RANNet adapter for the 64DD or bring up the fucking Satellaview servers from 1995, so what? Am I being unfair right now? Because I honestly, truly don't think that I am. <laughs> One of the big things that makes emulation important is preservation. Games that are restricted to outdated and often out of print physical media are doomed to eventually fail. CDs will get all scratched up and become unreadable. Cartridges deteriorate gradually, the contacts wear out, the save files die. I was right at the end of Super Mario RPG on the Super Nintendo and the save fucked up and I lost everything. Games that are no longer in print are in a finite supply. Only a select number of copies of these games exist, and without emulation they may all inevitably break and be lost to time forever. But when a game is preserved in a 32 megabyte file flying all over the internet, it becomes immortal. This is especially important for games that are rare and hard to find. Conker's Bad Fur Day is one of the most fondly remembered and unique games in the world, and there aren't even 55,000 copies in existence because Nintendo buried the shit out of it. I know a lot of people who played this game, but they didn't 
didn't do it on official hardware. No, man. They played that shit on an emulator. Now, drunken squirrels might be cool, but $200 cool? I don't know about that. Emulation keeps games like these alive, because even though there are very few copies that physically exist, all of which may deteriorate over time, the fact that it can be found online by anyone at any time, that will keep its memory alive forever. And maybe one day Rare will wake the hell up and make a sequel after all this goddamn time. <laughs> There's a famous quote from Gabe Newell that you've probably heard a billion different variations of a billion times and are probably sick and tired of hearing, and it goes a little bit something like this. You ever shit in a urinal, son? I can't say I have. Well, at the end of the day, someone always has to clean that turd out. Wait, no, not that one. I'm talking about this one. We think there is a fundamental misconception about piracy. Piracy is almost always a service problem and not a pricing problem. If a pirate offers a product anywhere in the world, 24-7, purchasable from the convenience of your personal computer, and the legal provider says that the product is region locked, will come to your country three months after the US release, and can only be purchased at a brick and mortar store, then the pirate service is more valuable. Now take again Mother 3, the pirate service is more valuable here because as an English speaker, Nintendo provided no service at all. And this is why the Mother 3 fan translation is the one thing they'll never take down by the way. Because then the service they'd be providing is to actively screw over the English speakers, which would be a disservice. These multi-billion dollar veteran game companies are selling something that a bunch of scrappy little commsci students have been doing better for decades. The whole NES, SNES, N64, Game Boy, and Genesis libraries are obtainable at the drop of a hat. While Nintendo is taking money for drip feeding a selection of games which may not even fully function properly, you can download a ROM of any of these older games, even the most obscure ones you can think of. But again, you need to weigh the advantages and disadvantages, because with the official solutions, there's none of that setup crap. Not to mention you can have a clearer conscience because it's more legal. On the other hand, with newer games, official services tend to be more valuable because pirating those games is not only a pain in the ass, but also extremely illegal. Not to mention you'll need a fairly powerful computer to run them in many cases, at which point it'd probably be more price effective to just buy the newer console instead. Official services for video games tend to be more valuable than that of the emulation community at first, but after a few years when the standards for PC hardware begin to evolve and change, and the parts get cheaper while the games eventually stop officially circulating, the emulators become more valuable. That's kind of the circle of life with these things. The Virtual Console on the Wii was a valuable service because it was a largely uncompromising job vis-a-vis -vis emulation. I'm sure you could point out some issues here and there, but for all intents and purposes, that was a legitimate way to play those games. So all Nintendo needs to do in order to get the drop on the emulation boys is to fix their shit and add some custom button mapping and add way, way more games, and maybe make it a tiny bit cheaper, because it really can and should be a legitimate service. So, um, yeah, get with it, Nintendo.